Good afternoon. Thanks for joining to this afternoon's session. It's a sponsored session organized uh, thanks to the support of uh, Inside Life Tech. The topic we're discussing today is uh, insight into coronary physiology. More specifically, what can a pressure microcatheter uh, mean to us clinicians, to us interventional cardiologists, uh, for clinical decision making and PCI optimization? Join this session if you want to recognize how coronary physiology can complement clinical decision making and optimize PCI results. To learn more about the role of pressure microcatheter in physiological assessment and to share the updates of this uh, new and uh, ongoing randomized clinical trial, the insightful FFR clinical trial. What's in, the, what's in the box? What is the session content? There is one mini lecture. We keep it to the minimum possible because what we like is to have an interactive session. So you are more than welcome to uh, share your comments, experience, to pose your questions. Uh, you can do that through your, uh, the app, uh, the PCR app, or by taking the microphone. But whatever will be uh, the uh, kind of interaction you would like to have uh, regarding this topic, we'll be more than happy to discuss that with you. We have selected a case of a physiology-guided percutaneous coronary intervention uh, that will be uh, presented by Carlos Colli. I don't see him yet, but he must be joining at any moment. And of course, integral part of the content of this session is your contribution. The team, let me introduce you with the team. Uh, my name is Emanuele Barbato, an interventional cardiologist uh, from Rome, Italy. I'm the current EAPCI president. Co-chairing this session with me, there is my good friend Adam Witkowski from Warsaw in Poland. Then we have Gianluca Campo from Ferrara in Italy, passionate about physiology like all our expert panelists. Cambis Masayeki from Lahr, Germany is also passionate about complex PCI, not just physiology. Whatever is complex, <laughs> Cambis likes it. Carlos Colet from Alst, he will join, as I said, at any moment. And finally, but not least important, Salvatore Brugaletta from Barcelona in Spain. So to set the stage, the first obvious question, we are in the era, and this is actually more of a kind of provocation to my um, expert uh, panelists, why do we need to discuss in 2023 of an additional intracoronary device, so a pressure microcatheter, to assess coronary physiology? So let's have a round of opinions, starting from Cambis at the end of the table. Yeah, Manuel, it's a good, good question, actually. But I think the major advantage is uh, whenever you did some, some of those kind of PCIs with the uh, FFA wire in, you might see that the wires sometimes get also destroyed, and uh, especially when you do the uh, uh, pull back multiple times. And to have a device where you just can go over the wire has um, multiple advantages. First of all, the, the wire itself, the workers wire is not so traumatic, can give you extensive backup as well. Uh, you have different uh, kind of subset of workhouse wires, and, and uh, so you can guide your, first of all, your pullback, your, your, your measurement initially, and also afterwards your PCI, right? So uh, for the, for the post-PCI measurement of FFR, and uh, this becomes more and more important, I think, uh, uh, in nowadays uh, uh, physiology assessment as well. The comment from uh, Cambis is, uh, for me, very valuable. As I said, Cambis is a super expert of complex core intervention, CTO, undergrade, retrograde, whatever grade. <laughs> and he does it with all the kind of uh, fancy catheters and microcatheters. So it is reassuring that you would see this device also to be used uh, to guide PCI, not just to indicate the procedure. Gianluca. Oh, thank you, Emanuele. Uh, I believe that uh, new tools are really important uh, to support the penetration of uh, coronary physiology because, for example, if we see in Italy, but also in other countries, the application, the systematic application of coronary physiology to indicate uh, the revascularization and to guide the revascularization is very low. So any tool that can improve the penetration of coronary physiology, so the possibility to improve the outcome of our patient 
patient is really appreciated, a microcut probably can be more familiar for uh, a lot of operator uh, uh, allow the increase uh, of uh, the number of assessment uh, in daily practice. So if I may summarize this uh, mid-term exchange of opinion, there is an unmet need in technical um, characteristics of the device at our disposal. There is an unmet need in adoption, so two good reasons. Carlos has just arrived, he's hydrating himself, so we let him drink, we won't disturb him. Salvatore, is there anything else you want to add on the very reason why we need to have this kind of session today? Uh, yes, uh, <clears throat> I can only echo so what uh, it has been already said and uh, overall thinking about physiology in, in general. I guess that uh, uh, so when we, we implant a stent, I guess that the stent is already with uh, the top level outcome possible. So what we need is uh, to understand when the stent is uh, something that we have to do. So to, we have to learn so when the stent uh, uh, is uh, something that uh, we have to implant. And that is physiology, so that the physiology may help us so to do it and to decide. Last but not least, Adam? Uh, me, yes. I... If you can come closer to the microphone. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, first, uh, we have in the guidelines that we should use uh, FFR intermediate lesion to know to proceed to PCI or postpone the PCI and treat patient medically. Second, we know that after angiographically guided PCI, in two thirds of patients, FFR is not increasing up to 0.9, which mm. does mean that it is the optimal result. So we should use again FFR with wire or microcatheter. It is equivalent because we know from the studies, from the smart studies, that these two methodology are the same. Uh, are equivalent uh, to know if we should optimize further. And I think it is a very important issue, which is not in the guidelines yet, but it is important. So thank you very much. We heard, are you ready to share your opinion? Yeah, please. So thank you, Manuela. So I think that this device actually is, is, is coming along with the developments in the field of coronary physiology, where the pullbacks are becoming more and more important. And, and we're gonna see this over the presentations, but one thing is understanding whether the lesion is significant or not, and another thing is understanding how to treat that lesion, and this is the value of the pullback. And this device is just helping us performing the, the pullback maneuver without losing wire position and make the things a bit more easier. That's a bit uh, how I see this connection. That's uh, actually an important uh, step forward we are making uh, nowadays in adopting current physiology in our practices, not just to say treat or not treat, but we are there is a paradigm shift here. How to treat, where to treat, how, much, how many stents, when do we start, where do we stop? This can be done, of course, with intracoronary imaging. This can be done nowadays also with intracoronary physiology. I think this is more or less the consensus I could capture from our colleagues. So before handing over the word to Salvatore, let me just understand what is the uh, unmet need here in the room by show of hand. Uh, let me understand how many of you have at disposal in, uh, in the cat lab uh, pressure wire to assess coronary physiology. Raise hand, pressure wire. Thank you very much. How many now in the room have a pressure microcatheter to assess physiology? Any pressure microcatheter? Raise hand. Okay. How many in the room have? Uh, angiography-based functional assessment. Raise hand. Excellent. So we've got more or less what is the status in the room. Salvatore, why don't you tell us what are the current trends in uh, invasive coronary physiology? Thank you, Manuele. As you said, so we have to change a little bit the paradigm about uh, how to use physiology in our daily clinical practice. So these are my disclosure. So we have to think that uh, something can change uh, from the past to now. So thinking about, for example, the 80s. So we were using uh, physiology for uh, analyzing intermediate lesion, but uh, now so we are doing uh, a lot of physiology, especially in trivestal disease. Uh, we're using uh, not only in stable, but also in uh, ACS stabilized patients. And uh, many times so we use also the pressure wire as a workhorse wire for PCI that is not always the best solution. But what is important, uh, what I like 
to uh, stress you is the physiology guide PCI concept, which is something uh, totally new, so that was not present even in the past. So many times, I guess that you face a patient like this, so a three-vessel disease. So like uh, you see on the LED, uh, circumflex coronary artery, many times, so you don't have any stress tests of this patient, so you don't know. So if the angina, so it's uh, due to one of, of, or maybe all these lesions, so you don't know if uh, you have to revascularize all, et cetera, and they are in trouble. And that is uh, when physiology so may come to you, and uh, it may be also your best friend. So, and uh, to use the concept of physiology uh, uh, guided the PCI, so there are two particular points that I want to make. The first one is about the pullback. So we are not just uh, discussing uh, the fact that you are measuring physiology one, uh, with just one value, so the famous value of 0.80, but the fact that after you have done this measurement, you have to do the pullback as well. And the pullback may give you very important information about the distribution of the disease. If there is uh, some focal distribution, as you may see, you're in the middle, or a diffuse disease, which is uh, going up, then you may see on the right-hand side. So if there is a focal or a diffuse disease, so something may be changed in, uh, in uh, guiding your treatment, because focal lesion is something that you may easily treat uh, with a stent implantation, but if you have a diffuse disease, so either, so you implant a stent, but you don't uh, get the angina free to the patient, as you may see, for example, in this study, so made by Carlos. You see that if you focal angina, so with the focal lesion, you may have angina free to your patient, but with the diffuse disease, okay, you may implant a stent, but nevertheless, the patient is still with angina, so you have to optimize medical treatment. So the second concept so is not uh, only about the, the, the pullback that you have to do, but also to use physiology after you have made your PCI. So that is something that sometimes when you use the wire, so we change the wire with a, uh, with a, a normal wire, and sometimes so we are uh, lazy, so we don't want to cross again the stent for making the post-PCI FFR, but it's something useful. No? You see here that in this study, so they recognize a threshold of 0.92, which is a threshold that may give you some uh, safety and efficacy, some insurance about the, the outcomes of your, or your PCI. And the, actually, so there was uh, uh, this algorithm, so which was uh, uh, shown in this uh, paper, European uh, Heart, that every time that you make a physiologist assessment after a stent implantation, you do as well with the, uh, with the pullback, and then you have to measure the transgradient uh, of this, uh, of this uh, lesion when you have implanted a stent. And according to where this trans gradient uh, is, uh, the trans stent gradient is located, see if it is located inside the stent or outside the stent, then you may decide either to implant in the first case, so to make a post dilatation of the stent, or for example, if this gradient is located outside of the stent, you may decide to implant another stent to increase this gradient. So that is something that we should take into account if we want to have a physiology guidance 2.0 uh, PCI. So according to this, so we designed together with Carlos and, and Emanuele, so this study, which is the insightful FFR study. So the study is going to enroll, uh, already started the rolling of the patient, uh, so uh, 2,500 patients either with CCS or stabilized ACS. So you see that uh, any kind of lesion between 30 and 90 percent of the ameter stenosis by your eye, so can be included, so it's very wide range of uh, uh, lesion to be included. And the patient will be randomized, so either to the use of physiology by use of the pressure microcatheter or by the pressure wire, so the normal wire that we usually uh, have in our lab. And what uh, uh, is more interesting about this study is not only I mean the, the comparison between these two different strategies, which will be in terms of uh, non-inferiority, but if the patient uh, so is going to receive a PCI in a second stage, so they will be again randomized to different strategy. One is the one that we use in our clinical practice, so standard of care, or the physiological, so induced optimization stenting, which is based on, as I showed you, the, the pullback, and then the post-procedure uh, FFR measurement. So I guess that we have some uh, cases later on, and uh, Carlos also will go into details about how to use uh, this physiology guidance. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Salvatore. Join us in the panel to have a little discussion on this lecture. Let's move a step further. We understood more or less what is, uh, what is your practice, what are the devices available in your lab. 
Now I'd like to know from you, how do you use these devices that are available? How many of you are using these devices systematically to diagnose, to understand whether a lesion is functionally significant, yes or no, and whether it needs to be revascularized? Raise your hand. Majority. How many of you is assessing physiology also after having treated the vessel, after having stented the vessel? Raise your hand. Slight minority. So-so. So-so. Time to time. I, I like the answer. He didn't say like this. He said like this. How many of you are using physiology also during the intervention? You know, much like we do with the intravascular imaging. Before, during, to assess several steps of the procedure, and after, raise your hand. Less and less. Less and less. Is there anyone who would like to take the microphone and, and share with us the... Uh, Adam, you will help? Yeah, thank you. The, yeah, okay. I would like so to hear like to <laughs> okay. from those colleagues who, who, just, uh, who just said that uh, would use physiology also after PCI, what is the value? Why do you think it is useful to do it also after PCI? Who wants to take this one? You just need to share your experience. That gentleman over there, I can tell you he will answer. His name is Dr. Pirot. I'm sure he will answer. Thank you very much. Manuel, I think it's first of all prognostic. We know that uh, from studies, and but um, um, to be really practical, I think we use it, or I use it for for reasons that sometimes my eyes are just neglecting other lesions. Well, that's I think nice. That Say it again. Your eyes are neglecting other lesions. Yes. Why so, don't you trust your eyes? Because I know that sometimes I think that this lesion is just moderate, but if it's situated proximal LAD or left main or or proximal dominant right it may prove to be uh, functionally significant. So um, sometimes it's just uh, mesmerizing to see because we think about FFR as a tool to defer our revascularization. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just a tool to prove that that point needs to be uh, treated as well. That's interesting. We used to hear that if you don't want to do a PCI, you just do a physiology. But you're saying exactly the contrary. Anyone in the room who had this experience you expected the lesion not to be significant, and you were surprised that it was indeed significant. Anyone? My friend over there is knocking. He is nodding with his head. Perhaps he can tell. No, no, over there, the gentleman who sat like this with his head. You don't want to intervene? I don't want to force you. Perhaps the other gentleman over there, Dr. Sabate, would like to say something. You know, I need to encourage my colleagues to intervene. Huh? They try to hide, but I can, I can catch them. Manel. I think that, uh, I mean, um, we have to use it. Uh, we have plenty of experience of lesions that apparently are non-significant and become significant, and tight stenosis in a small area that become non-significant, and you right. can avoid uh, the treatment. I think we have plenty of experience in both directions. So that's why uh, looking is deceiving sometimes, and then you have to, 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 to be sure that you have to treat uh, the, the lesions. And during intervention, sometimes when you have uh, several serial lesions, you can use the, 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 the physiological assessment, put a stent in the more severe stenosis, then repeat the assessment to see whether the proximal one becomes significant or not, and then keep on uh, the treatment. But I think this is the one. And of course, post-procedure is to, to, to be sure that the result is, is, is OK. Of course, if you want to spontaneously intervene uh, without any, an induced intervention, just uh, raise your hand. We'll come and give you the microphone. Any comment here in the panel on what we discussed so far? Um, interesting in the, in the issue, if you put a stand and you do the uh, high pressure post dilation and you would like to assess the, uh, uh, what is the final result, you limit it to angiography or you do an IVUS or you do a physiological assessment. So the question is two? Two, yeah. So Who, who, who is doing uh, just uh, the final assessment based on angiography? Please raise your hand. Be honest. Be honest, yeah. Be honest. Yeah. Hands. Who prefer to uh, do an IVUS or OCT, or intravascular imaging? Prefers, mm -hmm. eh? That doesn't Prefer. mean that you do it. If yeah. you don't have it, but if you could have it. 
Okay. okay. And who would like rather to use physiological assessment doing uh, post PCI FFR? Less. You know, we, we have to we have to make this easy, easy and quick. That's the point. We can say that in closed room, interventional cardiologists are simple people. We like simple things, quick and clean, if possible. Speak for yourself. Uh, I can tell you, uh, many of them are sharing. Opinion. You see, there is there is colleagues who want to share the. Can you can you give the microphone there? Not to Jolt, first to other friend there. Um, in our cat lab, uh, um, it depends about the, the patient and uh, about the, the lesion. If you do the pullback, uh, because we have a severial diffuse uh, uh, atherosclerosis, I think it is mandatory to mm. do pullback again after you have put uh, one, two, three stents. So in these cases, uh, we do regularly mm -hmm. and have a pullback. And uh, we stop only when we don't have uh, any more to treat. So in these cases, I think it is mandatory to, to do again uh, uh, physiology on the coronary artery. And I think also bus that uh, have um, a catheter yeah. is better in this case. To do yeah, in and out. I want to hear Jolt. And then uh, I'd like, in the meantime, to invite Carlos to the, to the podium. Thank you. Just one more comment I would like to make. Of course, uh, intravascular imaging is a perfect tool to assess how well the stent was deployed. But once we've done an FFR guided procedure, it would be a shame not to use it to, uh, to assess. And also, uh, something that we have to remember that very long stented segments tend to be underexpanded uh, right. almost by law. And that is easily elucidated by a post PC, a good, good quality pullback. And that's the easiest thing to correct with uh, high, pressure, high pressure ballooning. So I think it's, it's really, if you're there, with, with why, why not use it? Why after? not to use it? Carlos, before you start, we would like you to address two important uh, uh, points. One is a question from the audience. Yeah. You can just... Yeah, I, I, I just can read it. It's uh, uh, actually two questions. So the first one was, which pressure microcatheter allow pullback, also co-registration, Assist doesn't. Is the lumen loss with the microcatheter not interfering with the measurement? I think it is important. Okay, so these are the questions from home, and there is another important aspect I'd like you to touch or to facilitate in your uh, part of the presentation. Our friend over there in, said a very important word. He said, We stop doing pullback and we stop stenting when there is nothing left, to, left behind. So we need to understand what does it mean that we can be happy to stop intervention. A, f a, f a fractional floor reserve of one? Or is there a threshold over which we can say, OK, we did a good functional, uh, we achieved a good functional result? Word to you. Good. Let's start with the last question, uh, Emmanuel. I'm going to address it right away, because it's not in the presentation. Uh, I, I think that when we measure post-PCFFR, there is something that we have to have in mind, that is the fact that when the patient is lying down on the table, the LAD goes upwards, and that creates uh, hydrostatic pressure that makes the pressure in the LAD systematically lower than in the right coronary artery. So the normal FFR in the LAD cannot be one by definition. Exactly the opposite happens in the right coronary artery, because when the patient is lying down, the right coronary goes downwards, and that increases the pressure due to the hydrostatic effect, and that increases your FFR. I see sometimes our fellows that they put the wire in the distal right, which is a moderate lesion, and they say, ah, we didn't equalize well, the FFR is 1.03. No, the FFR is 1.03. The pressure there is higher than the pressure in the ossium of the right, and that is a normal phenomenon that we have to get used to. So I think this is one important question. So don't try to uh, chase a 1.0 in the LAD because it's not possible. And that is one, I think, a very practical message. The second question, Adam, was about the microcatheter. There are two in the market, as soon as I, uh, my, my knowledge uh, concerned. One is the assist, and one is the, the microcatheter from inside life. The, the microcatheter from inside life is a bit smaller than the one from assist. So that is one element contributing less to disturbance in flow induced by the presence of the microcatheter in the vessel. So I think that those are the. 
Well, we, we, we need to start the case. We'll try to address the question as we go. Please. I have to disclose that the bar is in the middle of the presentation already, uh, Emanuele, so please give me more time at the end. Okay. I will go. Good. So uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, and the way that we have set up this, this presentation is, is, is about, it's with a case, with a case that was included in CIFL FFR in our institution. So this is a 71-year-old male. Uh, you see the risk factors on the screen. And stable angina class 2, normal uh, renal function, normal ventricular function. And we're applying systematically this instrument called Seattle Angina Questionnaire, which refines a little bit the evaluation of angina and quantifies the angina in numbers. In this case, it was 69.72. But let's go to the case. Uh, we brought a simple case uh, with a very interesting message behind. So this is a simple lesion in the mid portion of the LAD. You can see it very clearly. This is the steel frame to show you the mid uh, LAD lesion. So no big surprise in terms of uh, uh, what uh, the, the case will be. We perform uh, angiographic based uh, fractional flow reserve. This is VFFR showing a VFFR of 0 0.79 with a focal pattern of disease uh, in the curve. But what I would like to spend uh, the next few minutes is to understand how coronary physiology help us predict what is going to happen after the PCI. And we're going to use two concepts that have been discussed by the panel before. One, coronary physiology is, has two steps. The first one is the measurement of the single distal point, and the second one, the use of a pullback. A single distal point without a pullback is half of the job. So you have to complete the measurement to understand, and I'm going to explain why. Let's imagine that we have this coronary tree. This is a left coronary system. You see it on the screen. And then we're going to understand what are the effects of PCI in patients with focal versus diffuse disease. To make the things even simpler, we're going to start with focal disease. And you see this proximal lesion in the, in the LAD. And we put the pressure wire, and we start pulling back the wire slowly. And in the right side of the slide, you will see how the pullback curve will be behaving. As soon as the sensor reaches the lesion, you will see an inflection in the pullback curve. And if you keep pulling back the pressure wire or the microcatheter until the opening of the vessel, you will see a very large translational pressure gradient. No surprise, this translational pressure gradient is, of course, related to the presence of this focal disease, which, again, can only be assessed using coronary physiology. Now, what is important is what is going to happen now. We put a stent. This is a stent in the proximal part of the LAD. We're going to uh, inflate, uh, implant that stent there. And now look what happened to the curve. It normalizes. And now post-PCFFR becomes 0 0.95. That's what we call high post-PCFFR. Now, let me show you the opposite side of the coin. This is a patient with diffuse disease. We're going to do exactly the same. We're going to put a microcatheter or pressure wire down that vessel, and we're going to start pulling back the wire. and then. We're starting to pull the wire back. Pay attention that the FFR in the distal part is exactly the same as the previous case that I showed you, 0 0.7. Then you keep pulling back the wire, and you see nothing in the pullback curve but diffuse pressure losses along the length of that vessel. You keep pulling back the wire, thinking that you're going to find a translational pressure gradient, but you do not. This is the definition of functional diffuse disease. The problem is that when we use angiography, we always find a place that says, ah, here's the lesion. Here's the lesion. I can see it very clearly. Here is a more severe. This is the lesion responsible for the, for the 0 0.7. So we might end up putting a stent. Of course, it's going to be a longer stent than in the previous case. And what is important is that after we place the stent, if we perform a second pullback maneuver, or if we look at the change in the pullback curve, this is what happens. Look at the curve. It remains diffuse. The FFR might improve a little bit. In this case, it went to 0 0.8. Now, what we have understood then is that patients with focal coronary artery disease are ideal candidates for PCI because the blood flow improved after the stent has been placed. And exactly the opposite happens when we implant the stent in diffuse disease. The improvement of blood flow is not significant. So let's go back to our case. And I have a few questions here for the panel. So, uh, we always start measuring uh, resting indexes. This is our procedure in the cath lab. And in this case, you see this tight lesion, angina class 2, and probably for Gianluca, the CRR, which is the equivalent of any other resting index, is 0 0.9. And this is negative. negative. So if you have a patient with angina, focal disease, and 0 0.9. So uh, what is your, your next step here, Gianluca? <laughs> Hyperemic. Hyperemic. Okay. 
this is exactly what, what we have done. So this is the FFR in that case. So it went from a negative resting pressure uh, ratio to a FFR of 0 0.69 in the distal part of the vessel. We induce hyperemia in this case with intercoronary papaver. So how should we proceed? Well, next step is to do a pullback. We need to understand whether this 69 FFR will benefit from a focal therapy like PCI. And we go the pullback. I show you the pullback. I have this video is not working, but this is the pullback curve of that case. Hmm. There is a simple or a single focal pressure drop in the mid part of the LAD. You see it very clearly. The maximal pressure gradient here in FFR units is 0 0.30. So this is a patient that would likely benefit from PCI. And this is exactly what we did. We also calculated the PPG index. You have seen that presented by Salvatore. This is an index that defined focal and diffuse coronary artery disease. And in this case, the PPG index was quite high, 0 0.74, pointing at the fact that this patient would likely benefit from PCI in terms of improvement in angina. This slide was already shown by Salvatore, but I just want to insist that we're very good treating patients with focal disease in terms of symptoms relief, but more than half of the patients that we treat with diffuse disease remain symptomatic after a, su and a successful PCI. So I like to, to say that these two elements of physiology, the distal point and the pullback, addresses two, two different questions. The first question is, does this patient need to be treated? And this is, of course, uh, answered by the FFR, the single point, the 0 0.8 that Salvatore was referring at the beginning. But the question on how this patient should be treated is completely different. You see here two different pullback curves. The one, the one on the left is a focal disease. The one on the right is a diffuse disease. And of course, you can imagine that would be the, what would be the outcome uh, uh, after PCI in both. So we have uh, developed an algorithm to help us decide what to do in the cat lab. And this is something uh, that we are going to look in the case. So in this case, we have a patient with a significant FFR. We do a pullback assessment. The pullback show focal disease, and there is a patient, again, that benefits from PCI. And again, we think that diffuse disease is better managed with medical therapy with selective use of PCI or surgery for symptoms control. Now, let's go to the PCI, uh, Emanuele. This is a predilatation, so predilated. We planted a science 3.023. This is the intermediate result. It looks pretty good angiographically. And then we said, OK, we believe in salt. We have to check with physiology. Let's go back with physiology. I put some questions, but we can discuss that later. Sure. Who would stop here? And I was just show my the angel, because it looked pretty good. Raise hands if you would stop, please. OK. Very good. It's a good start. Good. Let me show you what happened. So the wire was already there. There was a normal work was higher. The wire, uh, we decided to uh, check the post-PCFFR. Why? Because we know that patients that end the procedure with a low post-PCFFR have a higher chance of dying or having an MI in the follow-up up to five years, and this is a continuous risk proportional to the post-PCFFR value. So we measure post-PCFFR. This is, again, CRR, 0 0.90. So again, didn't change. It was 0 0.90 before, it's 0 0.90 after. Now we do FFR, and the FFR improved. It was 69, 0.69, now it's 0.75. So it's a little bit better, but suboptimal. 75, you don't want to end the procedure with a 75. So what we did, again, we measured the distal point. Now we do the pullback. And I have to say that this device, what, what allows for is to go in, in and out very fast. So it's really pushing it down, pushing it up. And this is what we found in the pullback. So a focal pressure drop inside mm. the stent in an apparently good stent from the angiographic point of view. That was a signal to say, OK, we have to fix this. So we went back. This is an algorithm for the post-PCI assessment. And I'm going to drive you through it. So we measure post-PCI FFR. If there is a focal drop inside the stent, we expand the stent more. We post-dilate. If there is a focal drop outside the stent, we, of course, consider it a second stent. And there is a no focal drop, purely diffuse disease after PCI. It means that the procedure is finished. So we did a 3.56, high uh, atmosphere dilatation, the proximal part of the PCI. The angiography looks the same. There is no change in angio. But we did measure post-PCI again, uh, post-PCI FFR. And this is what we found. This uh, CRR increased to 0 0.94, so now things got better. And the FFR increased to 0 0.85. This is the final pullback curve, now showing a complete flat line or diffuse disease, if you want to say, uh, that is diffuse pressure losses. But again, no focal 
translational pressure gradients that can be addressed either by post dilatation or a new stent. Carlos, this is a summary of the case. Hold on on the previous slide because it's an important uh, point there. The reason why you decided to stop at this point your revascularization is because your FFR went from below 0.8 to above 0.8, or is it because of the shape of the pullback curve? I think both elements play a role, Emanuele, and I, but I think that what the pullback is answering is what else can we do hmm. and where? Where is the residual focal pressure gradient? Can we post dilate more? Can we put another stand? And this is how we see these two metrics complementing each other. Okay, I think this is my last slide. So just showing you the evolution of the case. So before the PCI, 0.69 FFR, immediately after stenting with a very good angiographic result, but residual pressure losses only detected by physiology. And then at the end of the procedure, final FFR, 0.85. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Join us for the final discussion. There are several questions in the, in the chat box. Uh, please, Adam. Yeah, I think uh, there are two which are important in my opinion. Uh, first, uh, maybe I would like to ask uh, Carlos, is it possible that FFR measured directly after a stent placement will improve after some times, days, weeks, as a result of vessel remodeling or resolution of vasospasm, etc.? That's a very good question, uh, Adman. And what we, uh, what what could happen is when you do PCI to uh, lipidic lesions, norm most of the time they're focal. You can have distal embolizations. And if you have distal embolizations, this would mean that the microcirculation will be blocked by the debris of plaque that has been embolized after the PCI. If that happens, if you have a blockage in the microcirculation, all the pressure in your coronary will increase. So what can happen is that in those cases where we call it periposial MI, if you measure troponin the day, the day after, you will have an abnormally higher FFR than what would be after the resolution of the microvascular problem. So this is how this can interact. And Carlos, further to discuss the issue of the different uh, FFR measurement in RCA and LAD, there is a question. If there are such a variation of LAD RCA, why don't we have other normal values for RCA, for example, over 0.93 and LAD less over 1.87, for example? Well, that's a very good question. And, and you know, when, when, we, when we look at the data and we saw these results, the first thing that we did is we, we, had, a, we had a big meeting. We invited Bernard de Brun and Nico Pils, who are the father of this, and we showed them the data. And that was the first question. Should we think about changing thresholds? And then we went in, we had a measurements of almost 3,000 patients worldwide with pre and post PCFFR. What is interesting is that the amount of pressure losses, that, the, um, the amount of pressure difference that occur due to, to the hydrostatic effects are very small compared to what could be caused by a lesion. So when we look at the pre PCFFR, was similar in the three vessels. Mm -hmm because the effect of the lesion is magnitudes of order higher than the effect of the hydrostatic pressure. So for the pre-PCI measurement, I think we have sufficient evidence to rely on the 0.8 cutoff. For the post-PCI, it's completely different. If, you have compl if the angiography looks good in your right coronary artery and you have a post-PCI FFR of 90, there is a problem. 90 is too low for the right coronary. Right coronary should have a 1. That's what you should expect a 1.0 in the right coronary. In the left, in the LED, is completely different. If you have an 85, as I mentioned, a 90, that, that's, uh, that's completely acceptable. Let me involve in this discussion the gentleman over there, Jolt. You performed a pooled analysis of FAME 1, FAME 2, where you basically look into this aspect on what is the prognostic value of post PCI FFR. What is the insight you can share from this analysis? Yeah, it's moderate to say the least. And uh, I think the, one of the uh, reasons for this is that uh, if you apply uh, a common cutoff value for all vessels, of course, uh, and an LED uh, just been shown by, by Carlos with a perfect angiographic result and a, and a very good uh, physiological result, we'll have a post-PCFR of 0.85. 
Whereas in the right coronary, if it's 85, you definitely either have focal disease or residual uh, diffuse disease. So I think we have to have uh, a specific, vessel-specific cutoff. So we cannot use it as a blanket uh, cutoff value. We've just published our own experience from our center, over 500 uh, um, post pcf our measurements. And we show that there is a significant difference in the LADs and the, and the rights only after PCI uh, of 0.05 or 0.07 units. So why use uh, the same cutoff value for, for all of these values? It just right. makes no sense. And of course, uh, and another very important, uh, important uh, aspect is the diffuseness of the disease. So it's completely different to have a post PCFR of 0.85 if it's related to focal inside of the stent or outside of the stent, or if it's diffuse. The yeah. prognosis will be vastly different. And I think this is something that we never actually check for. I have, I have technical questions uh, um, regarding this microcatheter. Is there, any, is there any benefit of using it, especially if we use in complex corneal anatomy? I know each time I say the word complex, I don't know why I look to canvas. Um, I'm thinking to bifurcation, one stenting technique, two stenting technique. Is there any advantage there in assessing the main branch, side branch? Is there any value? I mean, honestly, in, 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 in this heavily calcified lesion, you, you might have also a problem with crossing, right, uh, as well, like, like low-profile balloons. It's, it's, mm. I mean, we have to be honest with what's going on, right? But in terms of a strat, a struts crossing, especially when you, when you think about a CERC, a left main PCI, where we see a much more with treatment, especially on the ostium CERC, where we have a actually not perfectly solved scenario at the moment, especially when we have uh, calcified nodules there as well. I think it's really worth to, to, to check if it's necessary to go further on with a two-stand strategy. So still, I think data, I don't know, please, uh, uh, Carlos, uh, um, uh, um, if, I, if I'm saying something wrong, but I, I, I'm not sure about data at the moment at this, at this part. I don't know them, but I think at this point, um, it's absolutely reasonable. And as well, uh, another thing is once you bring the patient back, and um, you do a reassessment. What's also in interesting, if you see some instant restenosis on the CERC as well, is just do an FFR and see if it's relevant before you ch ch uh, heating up again the, the process. Because uh, uh, oculomotorically, you you want to you want to do something, even a 75, 18 uh, percent QSA, uh, and you, you you think you have to do something. But if you ma make the FFR measurement, you will be uh, you will be surprised how often you can treat these lesions uh, even conservatively with instant restenosis. Adam. I think that the uh, advantage of the micro catheter, okay, I will use this one, is that you can keep your wire in the same position in the coronary artery. With uh, pressure wire, you have obviously moved the wire. It is not very uh, easy. It is not a very user-friendly device, a bit stiff. You can uh, damage the sensor and so on and so on. With micro catheter, you keep the wire in the same position and all, only use the micro catheter exchange for the another balloon on stand and again go on the same wire with the micro catheter to measure FFR. So I think from the operator point of view, it is a big advantage. And as well as you think about multivessel disease, right? Because sometimes you end up with using two wires if you just have to measure all the free vessel and free vessel disease, and that's really a great advantage. As well. I just have a little time left for a last comment, either from Gianluca or from Salvatore. You were both very quiet, you decide. No, from my uh, experience, uh, the, the major application of the microcatheter is in multivessel disease because mm -hmm. the procedure uh, go very fast and easier. It is really important in the pullback, as suggested Carlos, to focus the attention in diffuse or focal drop. It is important, especially in the post-PCI assessment, and not search for the value, but search for the pullback curve uh, to avoid to leave in the vessel some focal spot. You were quick enough. We got the bonus, Salvatore. Yeah, just a small que um, tip about the, the pressure wire. So we talk a lot about the distal tip, you know, to, uh, to preserve the, the, the pressure sensor, but also the proximal tip is the one that we use for crossing balloons, stents, etc. And that is the tip that we need to connect so to make the measurement. And sometimes, so although the pressure sensor distally so it works, so we break so this proximal tip and we are not able to connect again with the console to get our measurement. Thank you, Adam. I think it's time to conclude. 
to uh, draw some uh, conclusive remarks. I must say thank you very much to all of you because I learned um, quite a lot this afternoon. I learned that there is a place for physiology, not just to indicate revascularization, but also to check the result of our revascularization. But even more, we can guide our intervention. That is something really uh, uh, to be considered more and more. We have a tool, we open it up, it's there on the table, let's make good use of it. And secondly, this device seems to make our life easier because we can go uh, back and again within the vessel uh, while we, are, we have just entered the vessel safely without major problem and again very quickly. So we can assess multivessel disease, complex uh, coronary anatomy, calcified lesions. So we're just looking forward to see the results that will be available, I guess, in a couple of years from now of the insightful FFR trial to see whether we have also solid data to substantiate our reasoning today. With this, I thank you very much, and I wish you uh, a good evening and a good continuation of Europe ECR. Thank you. Great conclusions. Congratulations. Congratulations to you.